four four just seven stand by a minute just come on uh uh, what is your attack on? Okay, talk to him, see what that did. Charlie Hart, San Diego, 2-4, traffic 2-7. Uh, Charlie, uh, 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 just made a pass in there. Can you give us any? Uh, 2-1, uh, San Diego. San Diego, over. Okay, I'll three. put it a little closer than those trees. Let me come around with a loud three, and I'll put it on those trees there. Uh, Roger that, loud three. Damn door, she wouldn't let anybody out until she won. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, of course. I, mean, I believe anything about Jackson. I'm so Five of those, and the one that's sitting out front right here, 665. We're very privileged and delighted today to have some of Jim's family with us. Joanne, his wife, and Joanne, would you have your people just kind of raise your hand, family members of Jim Holden? Oh, wow. Big hand, right? Did some stuff in Southeast Asia that nobody else did. They went behind the lines and helped out guys that had been in CERT. These guys flew in the secret war in Laos and Cambodia. And every one of these guys, they're not gonna like this because they don't wanna hear this. They don't wanna be called heroes, but they are. And they're just absolutely delighted.
made me cry, Don. <laughs> I'm going to blow off the guy that really got this thing organized, Don Ingram to kind of introduce uh, the panel members. But before they do that, let's give them a big Tennessee welcome. Go, guys. direction not about heroes um, Mel Swanson really started this because I asked him to because of all the personal things that were going on in my family and he picked up the ball and started calling people and he got his guys and that's the hardest part to do and I appreciate that together we've been working since then to try to come up with a little bit of a program I'm not as organized as I'd like to be this day because of a lot of things that are going on in my life, but I had the ability and a son to help out here. Lloyd scrunched down over there. <laughs> to steal some music and use it in a different format, uh, I actually bought the music song and put it in a little format and used some Jim Wald stuff. And uh, we're going to start with that, and uh, feel free to cry at will.
next time and they're using a little more uh, <laughs> intimate stuff and, and uh, the next thing I knew and I actually pay, I had to pay to find you first I found that I'll never pay to find a name but I did <laughs> you're the exception and uh, but I got Chris and uh, or, or, no actually I think I got uh, I a lot of respect for him and, and he was just a great man I would like some of the other guys up here if they want to make any comment to also let us know how they felt about Jim Wolf. I kiss the earth that I worked under him and the luckiest thing I ever had to happen to me in my life is that I didn't get what I wished for which is an F-105 or an F-4 <laughs> and I got this tail dragging beast of a piece of whatever and, and went and did a job that was worth doing. Anybody else want to tell a little bit about what they think of Jim Wall, please? No, no. Don, uh, one of my favorite remembrances is uh, after Vietnam, when I got got to my first squatter uh, in Selma, Alabama, as a matter of fact, and I got called on the carpet for not saying yes or no, sir. Because <laughs> over there in our unit, we were a little band of brothers, and it wasn't yes or no sir it was yeah yeah of course yeah you bet that kind of thing and that was the kind of a atmosphere that jim wool promoted yes. and it made us so close and so so special as a group uh, and, and that's why it worked it actually actually worked and i got one more uh, fond remembrance we were on a search and rescue the sar and it was for a downed OV-10, a Marine OV-10. It was just over the border into southern Laos. They had been over there messing around. Let's go for a sightseeing tour, and they got shot down. And we went in there, and I don't know if we got both of them out or not, but we were in the process of a pickup. And I think most of you already know what the drill is, where you, you find them, you suppress the bad guy fire, that, that you lay the A1s lay smoke down so the jolly green can run in there undetected or unseen at least. They know he's here but they can't see him shoot at it. And the A1 start doing a big daisy chain around, just firing their guns, firing rockets, whatever there is, whatever you have on board forward firing ordnance to keep the, the ground fire suppressed. And all of a sudden my engine went pick up and it just started. I thought the whole airplane was gonna shake apart. And I, I knew I'd probably been hit, and I dove into the smoke. I didn't know what was in there, what was on the other. I knew, I knew that wherever they shot at me, if I went to the other side of the smoke, at least they weren't gonna shoot at me. And I yelled on the radio, I got a problem, got a rough engine, and the first thing Jim Wool did was, I say, he was, the, he was the SAR leader that day. He uh, assigned lead to someone else, flew right in, joined in on me on my wing, and escorted me all the way back to Da Nang with my airplane going like this. And I wasn't sure if it would even fly that far to get back there. And he, he brought me in. Mm -hmm. uh, Great. John's going to speak. Well, OK, go ahead, John. Go ahead. Go ahead. Go ahead. Go ahead. <coughs> I'm going to not uh, say exactly what was just said, but I want to say I totally agree with what was said. And when I was in Vietnam, I flew 258 missions, all the A1, and went on for years to fly airplanes. Nothing will ever replace the A1 and the group of pilots who were at the day. And within that group, General Wool is a 
thought. Professional. And do anything to take care of you before he took care of himself. And that's a leader. We don't have leaders like we do when we did. Proud to be part of that small organization. If I learned a little bit, I hope I can carry that forward. Thank you very much. The, um, one of the things that stands out most in my mind, and how Jim fit right on in with us, was when I first heard his first name, Lieutenant. <laughs> anyway, uh, probably the most significant thing that I remember most, it was my, I, I went through training with Jim and uh, Robert. We went over together. For some reason, he picked me up for his little unit. But um, the most important flight of my stay in Vietnam, Jim helped me out the most. We were in Bangkok flying home. <laughs> yes. And there was like five of us in the group. And they said, you four guys are going on Pan Am 707. And Lieutenant Roberts, you're on the C-141 that's going to the Philippines. Wow. You could just see it in my face. I'm <laughs> like, and he pulled this little staff sergeant aside and he went over and had a little talk. And they came back and he said, Well, all five of you guys are going. Mel was the commander uh, after a brief commander interlude uh, for one month, then Mel became the commander. And the guy that uh, did that, who isn't here today, I, we tried to get him to come up here and ask some issues at home that he needs to take care of. His wife's not in very good health. But he told me that, and he's, he's put this in writing, so he said basically for that month I just kind of did, I just held on and let things flow that were already set in place by Jim Wool. So then Mel came. He was like major, major, major in Catch-22. I don't know. One sneaked in the back. <laughs> One sneaked out at night. No, he was a good guy. He's a good, good guy. Man. Damn good pilot and all. But anyway, those two guys in succession, Jim, the way he had the organization going, I might having personally seen how he operated. I said, this baby's diaper is in dirt. I said, I'm not changing a damn thing. And I didn't. And we had fun. We had a lot of inexperienced young officers. All these guys were lieutenants. I was a lieutenant colonel. I took the rank <laughs> whenever it came down. And But anyway, if the transition from Jim's organization to my organization, our organization. There was no mys in our group. It was all us, ours. Because it had to be. So that's how I feel. <laughs> Uh, we're going to start out just a little bit more talking about Jim Wool, then we'll transition into talking about the unit, what the unit did, how it, what it was about. So Jim Wool started it, and I can explain all of that. But, and I served mostly under Jim Wool. Basically, uh, yes, I just had a few weeks where, but I was mostly on leave. Today. And Jim set a lot of standards there. Now we had other people that helped. And they're not able to be here. Dean Detar, for one, was instrumental. Dean and I butted heads a few times, but Dean was a very aggressive and a great guy. Brenda, Air, 
everybody can't. <laughs> I would have never lasted under your belt. But anyhow, and we both know that. Uh, but uh, he would have had my butt. But um, Dean uh, got an Air Force Cross for a mission he flew, and he deserved it. I happened to be there that day. Um, we had Tim Buttermore, who's a major, was in there. And uh, we had Bob Carr that can't make for health reasons as well. And Bob Carr saw a bunch of frat boys, which I wasn't one of, but I guess I fell in that category somehow, <laughs> unofficially. A uh, bunch of smart ass lieutenants. But somebody had to keep us uh, in line a little bit, and Bob did that, and we used to give him a real bunch of grief about it, try to harass him in any way we could. But I do understand what he was doing, and I'd like to give him credit for his efforts. And uh, who am I leaving out in the major cat? We that was Otis Morgan. Well, that, and later on we did. Otis came in. There's people that took the place. But at the initial cadre that Jim inherited, uh, we had uh, I think uh, eight lieutenants out of twelve pilots. And I built rosters for every day. Both pilots and everyone's perfect, but I did that from orders. So I would uh, like to say that for me, working under Jim was quite special. I understood that at the time. And he, he did a lot of things silently. And uh, yeah. under, under, yes, <laughs> to his family. Now, you have to understand here, uh, this, we were sworn to the same standards that the Mac B SOG teams were sworn to. And we have a couple of those gentlemen here, I hope. Uh, and these teams were secret in the secret war. The secret war was no secret. But the guys that are on these teams were, were actually really were secret. And if you don't think so, their reward for, uh, they were told they keep their mouth shut for 20 years or they go to jail for 20 years. And I think, uh, you guys signed paperwork to that effect. In our case, I don't remember signing anything, but I remember being told that basic thing, and we were supposed to keep our mouths shut. And I think Mel and I both agree we are damn proud of that because you haven't seen one book, you don't know anything about us, and Mutza's Bible on the A1 has one little reference, one little sentence that somebody called Ola existed. And that, I think, is a tribute to men keeping their mouths shut and doing what they did. And that included their families in almost all regards, too. And uh, my son can vouch for that. And for me, this is a new recent call. You know, I know everybody up here is not exactly where I am and uh, ready for this. And some of the people that weren't able to come or didn't chose not to come, same thing, I get that part. Now, Back to Jim. I've been compiling some things, and this is just one example, and I'm not gonna show you a bunch of charts and stuff, but I do wanna show you that I built this roster on 15 March, and I have that up there for a reason. So you'll see that we had, no, I'll bring it back up, thanks. Uh, we have Jim Wall, Commander, we have Tim Buttermore, Dean Detar, Paul Hooper, who was a captain then, but he arrived as a lieutenant, and he made captain, uh, he made first lieutenant, I think in November, I'm trying to remember what, anyhow, he, he was new. And Dave Freestad was there at this time, replaced Bob Carr, who went home. And then we had, basically, you see all those lieutenants, those were the cadre of the first guys that did this in the middle of November. So you got Matt Coleman, John Weinick, Jim Seif, Jax Roberts, me, uh, Doc Blanchard, and Larry Cabin. So, <laughs> if you read books about A1s, if you read books about it in KP fine, you will see that, in the opinion of most people, no lieutenant should be in a damn A1. They weren't qualified to fly an airplane, not because it had a tailwheel, but because of the missions that it did. And the fact that we did search and rescue, get command responsibilities, and they wouldn't train very many lieutenants, hardly any in the beginning. So Jim Wold handpicked some of the people that are on that list. Uh, I really don't understand why I was on that list, but anyhow. And he had, was gifted, or not gifted, 
a bunch of lieutenants. But I never felt like he treated us that way. And the one thing I will say about him, I can go and thanks to Joanne sharing his records, I can make sense out of some things. And he nurtured us silently. He, you can see that he would fly with us periodically and kind of hall monitor us without having that feeling, oh crap, here comes a check ride. You know, we're gonna get so here, somebody's gonna be watching us and all that stuff. He was really good at that. And uh, Bob Carr took care of the disciplinary things. I don't think Jim told him to do that. I think he, uh, he enjoyed it. Yeah. Any comments like that, please have that. I'm not interrupt it. Anybody who interrupts as much as me will do that. But so, and that was a real neat thing to have. We were lucky. And most lieutenants, they got jobs over there flying, I'm not saying all, and, and also we weren't the only ones that did our missions. I don't, just want to make that correction. People before us in the first, people before us in the sixth at Lake who did the missions. The distinguishing thing about us is what the unit did with Jim Wool. I'm going to go back to that in just a minute. So on 15 March, Jim Wool, we had an A4 pilot. Pete Schwanz, Schwanz, and Pete Schwanz was what they called a ghost bear on a uh, aircraft carrier, and he was launched uh, at at the end. They did a spare as if one of the planes uh, wasn't ready to take off for some reason. He would just fill in the slot. They put him on a cat and launch him with another one, and he'd go out and fly. But Pete, this day, uh, the last flight was going. So they said, we'll make you a gold spare. And he just tagged on to another two ship. And they went to a little town called Chapone. And there is music about Chapone I could play here, but it probably wouldn't be lovely well, little coffee shop. <laughs> yes. It was one of the worst places you could go in, in, in the Vietnam War. And people wrote songs about it because of the guns, because of the oh. number of people that were shot down there, because of how bad it was. It wasn't as heavily defended as hand hard, but it was damn close. Yes. And so this, uh, I want to preface this, that Pete Schwarz had been on a uh, roll. I talked to this man because of records that I got from Joanne and because I could know how to search for things and because I'm a persistent butthole. But I searched and found him, and he confirmed, I found, and I couldn't get him in my normal sources, but I found something from his squad and talked about this stuff. So he told me here recently, he was gonna be here today, but he couldn't make it. I would have loved for him to be here to tell this story that I'm only paraphrasing. But this day, he, before this, he had taken a trap, hitched a wire on the aircraft carrier, and stopped, and the landing gear on his A-4 collapsed. And the landing gear on an A-4 is about that tall, so he's got little bitty wings, and so it isn't like it just tilts over a little bit. It was like this. He was with his hands on the handles, ready to eject sideways off of this carry. But nothing happened, and that was one thing. Then a few weeks later, as I recall, he was out and got nailed by a 37 or something, and it blew 18 inches off of his wing, sort of like Jack's Roberts one day. 300 holes in his airplane. He got it back to the boat, and that one was canned. Then he goes now, we're back to real time, sort of, and he's now that tail end Charlie on this three ship. So what do gunners do? You know, the first guy rolls in, and then you know, the next one's coming, and they wait for that tail end, Charlie, number three, and they blew his plane up. And he was in a dive at Chabon at night, on a new moon night, and he was able to control the airplane enough to zoom it, to get to about 8,000 feet, 200 knots, and he punched out of his airplane and went on the high ground near Chabon. And now he's by himself in the jungle. And now he starts thinking about eight months. A nail fat comes out, makes contact with him, says, I'll make in touch with you each hour. I will get you a SAR going. 
and they'll come and get you at first light. B. Schwanz thought that was the minute the sun got up about that far, <laughs> and they're going to rescue his butt. But he walked around on what he called animal trails, I'll bet muddy that they were actually, well, some troop tail trails perhaps. Got to a water hole, saw some mounds that he thought looked like about the size of a human being, decided that's no good, and crawled into a briar bush and started waiting for somebody to help him. In the meantime, back at the ranch, somebody calls Ola and says, we have a first lighter. And we would have rotations of guys that were going to be on call the next morning to go fly these missions. And the first thing I thought of when I looked at this, Jim Wolf was on this. And he's got Dave Freestead. And my first thought was, I wonder who the real guys were that were supposed to take that mission. Maybe me, maybe Larry, maybe Jax. Who? Who on that list was supposed to go? And Jim Wold, I thought, I bet he took that. I bet when he saw that this was going to the worst place on the planet Earth to go, I thought maybe he took that. Sometimes I actually pretty smart. And uh, I did find out. Pete told me, yes, indeed, when he went back the second time to thank Jim, that he told him not only did he take it, he was sick, and he took it because that's what real men do, and he did. And he took care of us, somebody here, I don't know who, and he flew that mission. Now normally when these missions happen, they get a big gaggle together at NKP, and they park this armada, and I, but this was like a snatch and grab. He went out with Dave Freestand, he got two, those are Mel's words, and he got two Jolly Greens, and he didn't show up at eight, he sh or at first light. He showed up about nine o'clock. He launched at first light. Um, I don't know the exact reasons for that. He may have uh, actually wanted that to happen. I think probably the gaggle theory would hold also that they were forming a gaggle. And he and Dave Freestead flew out to Chapon and they went looking for him. And they didn't go out there and flow around and start, uh, spend a lot of time. They went down and got him. Basically, Jim got down low uh, and told, uh, well, first thing he did is he tried to find a survivor and mark the spot. Pete Schranz told me he almost got him with one of his Willie Pete rockets. It was really <laughs> close. The white marking rockets and Willie Pete, you think napalm's bad, Willie Pete's worse. If anybody knows about white that. White phosphorus. Yes. So, thanks, man. And so, Pete says uh, that was really close. Then, uh, usually when the two A1s went out, one kept one jolly high when you only have two A1s after we decide they're going to go do this. So Jim Wold singly went down and started escorting in the other helicopter at Chapo, not with a bunch of other assets, just doing it. He goes in there and tells them we're coming in with the job. And Pete says, oh, he sees that jolly. He's looking at it right out there. Well, he's looking at the one with Dave Freestad, high jolly. And I was like, there it goes. Jolly Green flies right. Hey, hey, wait for me. He fires his flare and he starts talking on the radio. And the guy turns around and comes back. They went right over a, a gun pit. Not a gun pit with no guns in it, a gun pit loaded with guns, but nobody home. Oh. And another thing that was working for them was there was some fog on the river down in, on the river at Chapon. And they turned around, got him on that helicopter, and uh, out of there. Go home. So, some stuff didn't, I'm thinking, wait, you, know, you don't go to do a snatch and grab at Chapon. But maybe you do. If you go out with an armada and start bugging bees, you know, I mean, you can run over. Uh, uh, yellow jackets one time with your mower and you'll be as a free pass the second pass they're sworn at <laughs> yes and so i think it matters the heck i think my personal opinion i think jim wold said let's just see what we can do here and get it done so i thought that for a long time and then i read dick diller's book and dick diller 
I wrote a book uh, called Firefly. It's an interesting read. Um, I kissed the earth a bunch of times reading it, but I didn't do what he did. But he wrote in there that he was already airborne that same, very same day with four other birds, including Colonel Morris and some people, full of gas. And so the gas Morris birds was, were there. Morris always was full of gas. Carry on. He was our hall monitor. He was wonderful for that. But he was a good Explain guy. Explain what you mean by full of gas. <laughs> yes. yes. This is uh, the CNN gas. No. CNN did his big expose. We were dropping tear gas. Tear gas. They used tear gas to incapacitate people and including the survivors sometimes just so that they could go down and take the right guy out of the jungle. The few people I know that ever experienced that were hugging a tree and every cavity in their body was doing something involuntarily. And they said it was not fun, but it didn't kill anybody. And so, um, and I'm not saying maybe somebody didn't go down there and kill someone when they happened to pick somebody else up, but that's another story. So the, these gas birds were out there. And then Pete Schwanz told me that there were also 73 other flights all hovering around out there for this big deal. You know, the poor Jim, was gone. Yeah, they had a party and Jim Wolf wrecked it. He just got, he went and got the guy and took him home. <laughs> KP guys out there, they got a division of junk flying around. I think it's humorous. I may be off a little bit. If anybody thinks so, please tell me. But so uh, I'll end it just quickly that Pete went back and got on the ground and back to Denang. I don't remember any of this. Do you guys have any memories of it? The first thing, he was a little irritated because he had a pretty new flight suit on and the jolly green stenciled in green paint the feet that they put stencil on things on his brand new flight suit. But he got over that. He went to the bar and went to the club and tried to get some champagne and he, and he wanted to buy some and they wouldn't sell him any and then he wanted them to give him some and they wouldn't give And finally he harassed him enough and said, look, I got you out of Chabot and what are you going to do? And pretty soon the guy says, if you invite me, you can have all the champagne you want. And they had a party at the club for the people that were there. But not only did he do that, then he went back to the boat, the, the aircraft here. A week later, he got on one of the little S 2s or whatever they had to shuttle people back and forth to land, and he came back and threw a big party, another one. So he wasn't trying to skirt out of coming down here, he, you know, but he'd already done it. And I, I don't know, I don't remember. Does anybody here remember that particular party? I don't. I just don't. A lot of things I don't remember. But, I couldn't uh, remember at the point in time the Vietnamization was happening in the war. Nixon had been bombing the Cambodia into the smithereens, he thought, and they were going to cut back American presence. And it was decided to send all the A1s to Thailand. And then we have our guys on the SOC teams again. That means those planes have to go a long time to get to tri border, to get to the DMZ, to get to parts of Vietnam to help guys on their teams. And somebody wasn't thinking when they decided to do that. And they wanted American pilots to do this. So I was moved permanently, and Doc was moved permanently, uh, Larry was moved permanently, uh, who else up here? A bunch of us, uh, Bob Carr was, and Glenn Manning was, and uh, some other people were sent permanently to NKP for our new life. I, it was okay, but I was having a lot of fun. I flew five missions up there, got checked out. And uh, 11 days later, they came to me with this look like, boy, you know, we hate to tell you this accident would have loved to make, make me cry, but you're gonna have to go back to in country. And then I said, where can I get an airplane and go? <laughs> and what I didn't know at that time was that Jim Wolf was called to NKP. I know, again, from these records, on 10 November to go meet with Colonel Crosby and the hierarchy of the, of the people at NKP. His job was going to, I, he may have known why he was going, he may have been introduced to this there, I do not know that. I do know that they then told him that they wanted him to command this new unit. 
and I guess he had some selection in who he picked. I don't quite know all the details of that. I can have suppositions on that. I do know that we were told that Jim Wold said, we don't want any fat faces. You have to be able to see out both sides. Clarify so these, fat face. Yes, a fat face is the two-seater A1. It has the blue room behind it and all this other stuff. And you cannot see out that right side very well. So you have to drop a wing and make your exposure, and there are all kinds of reasons you don't want to do that. So Jim Wool told him, and we had at Play Cool almost all H's and J's, like Neil's there, the single seater, the one that kind of looks like a fighter, though it's pretty fat. So it, he told him that, that I know, and he got what he asked. And so for some reason, he picked me and Bob Carr, and we flew back in a three ship. Those flights I showed you where Jim had somebody on a wing and everything, I was taking those pictures. I could never remember why I was in a three ship, but that's what it was. And we went back, and we arrived on the 12th of November. 12th of November, Jerry Helmich was killed. The 6th was closing on the 15th, and Jerry Helmich was killed on a big SAR. He was a good guy. I did not know him very well. Others may have things to say about Jerry. It was, uh, he, technically, he was still in the 6th, three days. And we were going back to inform two detachments. Detachment 1, which was going to be at Play Coup, and Detachment 2, which was where three of our guys already were. Jax Roberts was up there, Dean Detar was up there, and John, John Wine at that point in time. And I may have some of this wrong, but I think I'm pretty good on it. So they left those guys at Da Nang, and the plan was to close down Play Coup for all A1s on the 12th of December. So it was a one month period. And we had two detachments. So I count that as a start of old. I can count whatever I want to count, whether it's official or not. I, that's where I start, 12 November. Then uh, we flew missions, and we were no longer carrying, doing frag missions, carrying big, heavy, hard bombs. We were done with that. The rest of our life was spent in the weeds, down close air support for teams, down on the ground for for rescue missions. Whatever we had to do, we could do. And I have right here, I was really lucky. Let's get lucky on the internet. Tell them what the missions were. You tell them. <laughs> yeah. Missions were to die for. <laughs> yeah. That's how important they were. You can just pass this around. It is our, to have that it, these, I go on the internet and get dangerous on there, and I find our rules of engagement for Ola, starting in November of 1969, going through 1972. Oh. <laughs> the, these are our rules that we are committed to fly by. Not much here. <laughs> Show Pass it around. <laughs> you, will see, you will see an assortment of fish on Anybody, did somebody get this yet? Very yeah. convention this past October. Forever, there was a 50 foot gap. That was the difference between our airplane and the guys up the ground, the wrecking guys. Well, yeah. we, uh, we operated at almost no feet sometimes, or certainly 50 feet above the trees or lower less. than the eyes, they can see. But anyway. Um, it was good. It was really good. But we closed the 50-foot gap. And Don told me the other day that what we did were missions to die for. And I agree. I think that's going to be a model I'd like to talk to you guys about sometime. But I really think, because I kept saying to myself, why didn't we talk about death all the time? Why didn't we worry about things that I read in the books that other too damn hungover. <laughs> That would be one explanation. <laughs> Whatever happened to me, but uh, uh, actually, as I think about this, I think you know, if you're doing something that's worth dying for, you don't worry about that stuff so much. That's my theory, and I'm sticking to it until somebody corrects me. 
And I think that helped a lot. I also think that um, it had a lot to do with the fact that we flew almost half of our missions for Mac B SOC. And Lyndon Gill is in the back here, and you worked at Play Who, I know. And I hope I, you don't have any thoughts that I'm taking anything away from what the Six did because they did some horrific missions at the Ashaw and all that stuff. The defining difference was the reason our unit existed was because Mac V. Sock insisted that we have a unit. And I suspect that what they said was you're going to have to have some airplanes in today eventually. And I'm going to guess they want, they figured they'd have to have four or six airplanes at least to support that. Well, if you're going to have those, why not have some guys there that can do SARS too? And I think that's how we came up with 10 airplanes and 12 pilots. And Jim Wold also did another wonderful thing. I could give you a copy. He wrote an end of tour report that I have a copy of. That, that I don't know if you gave me or where I got that one. I sent it to you. Ah, thank you. Yes, Phil Wold sent that to me. And I just, this is gold, man. And he had a number of things to say. But uh, it was really interesting for his perspective of how very many times we flew as much as a full squad with half a squadron of resources. And so it's, and there would be days we'd fly three times. Sometimes we wouldn't fly at all, whatever. You know, you just don't, and sometimes we sat in that airplane total in a day as many as seven or eight hours, some of us at various times. I think Matt Coleman actually had a seven hour mission. He told me when he got back, this was for, for Cowpoke, he told me when he got back from the seven hour mission, he said, Don, I was so fatigued and so up for this being out there with all this tension all this time. He said, I couldn't pee standing up. I had to sit down and pee. <laughs> <laughs> it just, you know, everything, I guess every muscle in his body was wound up tight. But we, so this, our job and Jim Wool, I really like the fact that that we did the work. Now, who's we? That's another thing I want to say. We is from the bottom guy in the unit to Jim and Mel. Bottom up. Armorers, maintenance guys, everyone. Guess what? When Dean Detar was assigned to babysit, 35 really happy mechanics are leaving NKP to come live in country in Da Nang, Rocket City from their nice little accommodations in Thailand. And I'm sure they were all dragged across the Laos to go to that job. But Dean got them accommodations, and I know guys like John and other people were a lot better than I was about telling these mechanics on a regular basis how wonderful they were and what they did for us. But I'm gonna tell you, later on I talked to those guys, they kept clippings about what we did, they were as proud of what was going on in that unit as any person there. Levy? No, really. Yes. And they should have been. And nobody had to tell them that. They just figured it out. And so they busted their butts. That's as nice as I can say it. All the time. When Mel did Tailwind, I'll let him talk about that. Busted their butts. Doc Siang busted their butts. And Jim had a good rapport with him, but I think really Dean should get most of the credit for that because Dean worked with those guys on a regular basis. That was his job, to set that up. And when, uh, in this chronology, a few days after I got back to play goo, Matt Coleman was sent up to join the four guys that were up there, and I don't know the exact date, because Dean had new duties. He was going to be busy doing all this other stuff. So now they had four men up there, and then we had eight men at uh, Play Coop. We did this deal for a while, it separated, and on 12, November, uh, 12 December, we had a party at the club that I would just as soon not remember. Well, actually, I don't remember much. <laughs> but I have a picture of John Whiting with a bottle of Old Crow in his pocket, getting 
It could have been Larry Pavender, but somebody who was sliding down the bar for a carrier landing, if you guys know anything about <laughs> pouring beer on tables and uh, pretending you have hooks and getting really stupid and drunk. And uh, we, we, were, we were perfectly clear in turn. I mean, we have yeah. all the rules on four <laughs> <laughs> uh, I uh, I flew an A1. I was supposed to go back. I, I think I have to believe this or I'd have to slash my wrist. I was told that I was going to fly back in the afternoon or midday, and I went back and uh, I'll say I fell asleep, that would be one way of putting it. <laughs> and uh, a couple hours later somebody was shaking me in bed and said, hey, you're going up to Danae, are you kidding me? And so I ran around and drank a bunch of coffee and I thought, well, I can fly to NKP or to, to, to Danae up the coast. And I was on Glenn Manning's wing, and uh, we got up there, and I landed, and I thought I'd feel better, but I didn't feel very good after we landed. And I'm thinking to myself, you know, I'm okay. Thank goodness I'm here. I'm going to get some rest, and I'm going to behave myself, and I'm never doing this again. And he said, we're hot turning you. you got troops in contact. You're going out. <laughs> <laughs> so I drank a little core coffee, and I went out there, and I had this really exciting talk with myself about a lot of curse words about, you can't do this, you moron, looking at myself in the mirror. And fortunately, they canceled that. We did some other thing. And that was the last time I ever did that. So, but, because um, you can't do that. Now, we joined units at, th at that time. John, your records show me something that's really confusing to me. I don't think we really officially became OLA until 1 January because you were still assigned to the 602nd where you had never planted a foot, but they had administrative things to do between the 15th of November when it closed and whatever. So now Jim's got this unit. The first one thing that happened that's very sad is Glenn Manning flew into a mountain on an approach to Da Nang Air Base. And it was, it was a combat loss, but Whatever. I'm not going to say what I think because I don't know. I wasn't there. But uh, we took days that Jim had this new thing going and we lost a plane. And we couldn't find it. And we looked and looked. And it was right there at our radar approach to Danae. And one day, and Larry thinks that when you, you told me that when you got there, you thought we were still looking for good men. And that was what, the 26th of December? 25th. And he went down, I think, on the 17th. I know it was a while. And one day somebody said, maybe we should look on the other side of the mountain. And he had flown somehow between the peaks and kept going to the west too far. And assuming too much time, turn around, go back, and hit, I think, about 50 feet from the top of the mountain coming back. That was our first loss. And Jim Holt's tenure, he lost three airplanes, because he gets the credit for that, quote unquote. Um, but he lost one man. And Dean Detar went out of one airplane that was destroyed, and why am I having a, who was the other? Freestad. No, Free, Free, Free Dave Freestad, yes. Freestad. Dave Freestad came over and was working a cowpoke star with uh, Pete Williams, and he had to go out. And he was rescued right away because the forces were sent home the next day because uh, that was, yeah, third, was his third, third, third time. Yeah, two times in A1s and once in the backseat F4. He and he, he didn't never, want. Did he try to fly again? He said he would never. Uh, no, no. no he said I he think he fly, might. But uh, after his first pickup, he said he wasn't going to go and get on a rope. He wanted a helicopter to come and him. Freestad did? Yeah. Well, so the second time he got shot down, I don't think they had a rope. He got shot down. <laughs> yeah, he had a knife ejection at Chapon, and he, um, they were in the process of picking up that guy at Cowpoke because they've been shot off so many times. And then they went, and Freestad got shot, and actually Pete finished up the SAR. Yeah. And then went, took the other jolly and went and got freeze dead. He yeah. had a wheel well fire yeah. and ejected. But um, three losses, I don't know, sounds like a lot. My understanding, and maybe Lyndon can tell me about that, but I believe when 
I know that Jerry Helmich was the last man lost in the sixth. I first, I think they lost 12 men and 15 airplanes and they were in business for, I think, somewhere between 19 and 20 months. But you, you can't do what we did and not have losses. No way. You just can't. And later on, they actually tried to go to a situation where they didn't want any more losses. And they tried to tell us, we're gonna fly higher and mellow get into that. But I'm gonna tell you, you can't support a team you can't support them and do run a SAR. You got to get down in the weeds. The play cool lessons that I remember being told when I got there was if you're down and have to get down low, stay low. You're not in an F-16. You can't go way up and pop and go back down like this. So A1, it, A1 zooms like a rock. Yeah, about <laughs> 10 feet up. <laughs> it, it is a rock. So, the bottom line of the whole thing is, once in a weed, stay in a weeds. Sounds crazy, but if you're shooting through a hole in the jungle, you have a limited amount of time that you are exposed, and they're shooting at sound, and I don't know. I only got hit one time, and I won't go into that, <laughs> but uh, the it was never out of combat situation that I was hit, and because I don't think they had much time. And anybody who didn't get hit, I know Larry Warren never did. I'm jealous about that, right? Isn't that true? Yeah. I'm done. Larry was almost at 10,000 feet. Yeah, that's right. <laughs> but we have to assume since he's a pilot, it had to be all skill, right? We all know. Yeah, that. Yeah. If it was me, I'd say that. But anyhow, so um, Jim had an interesting command. He wrote some very uh, interesting things in his final report about why, what sense did it make for us to have to expose ourselves and all the air rescue resources to people. Uh, uh, they got on the ground because they were fast facts and they were getting down in the weeds. Um, that will probably offend some people in this room maybe, but. Um, it's an interesting concept because how much do you see ripping along at 400 knots out of you know with one guy looking and one flying? Vice, what you gain? Um, I don't know. It wasn't my call, but he wrote it in his report. He was very proud of what he did. We were very proud of him, and I think that's enough about just talking about Jim Wool. Although I will entertain anything that one of the family members wants to talk or these guys. If you have any questions, yes. I just wanted to share one thing that a few times that Dad talked about a little bit is that there were you know, times when he'd come home not thinking he'd been hit and the bull would, the plane would be shot up all over the place. And other times you didn't even think he'd be under fire and he'd come home and there would be um, bullets in there, you know, and it's kind of a, an unknown thing the way he kind of talked about that. Yeah, that reminds me of one other quick one. Bob Carr, I interviewed Bob Carr. I wish he could be here. And Bob Carr told me, he said, he was with Jim on one of his first flights. And they had a little uh, bamboo bridge across some river or creek or whatever. And Bob was, Bob was never hit. Bob was aggressive, but Bob was smart. He, he, he took calculated risks in his way of looking at things. And, uh, Bob says, uh, was watching Jim, and he went, got down in the weeds for a bridge. So my theory, my way of looking at things is nobody ever built a damn truck that I'm going to think is worth dying for. I'm sorry. Mm -hmm. Now, the theory that you hear from some of the guys at NKP and it's valid, yeah, that truck may be carrying a bunch of weapons that can go down and kill a bunch of Americans in South Vietnam. But I would vote that we do that in a harbor or up there when they're coming across the border in China and not make some World War II-ish airplane go down and try to kill a truck at night or do it, whatever. So, but we did that. A lot of you once did. I didn't do that much of that, fortunately. Just the earth again. But these trucks were not worth dying for, and neither were these bridges. So Bob Carr was giving Jim a checkout, and when he landed afterwards and Jim was taxiing in, there was a stream of oil going out of Jim World's airplane all the way after he landed, all the way back into when he parked. And he had taken a bullet hole in the oil cooler. 
And Bob Carr is a captain, and Jim's a lieutenant colonel. And uh, to say one thing about him, Bob Carr, he's a straight shooter, because he shoot, sure shot me straight a bunch of times. <laughs> but he told Jim Wool, you know, that's a little bridge down there, and why were you down that low? And you know, if you were about to run out of oil in this airplane, so Jim was a human being just like the rest of us. Sometimes you gotta learn things the hard way, or sometimes you gotta have somebody shake you a little bit. And obviously that lesson was received. And uh, best I know, that, that sort of thing, he stopped. Take one. Fast movers in the night means search and rescue at first light. Oh, 